December, 1899. The world waits to greet a new century. The captains of industry are making vast fortunes on the backs of others. But down narrow streets and dark alleys in the big cities of North America, the future for many holds only the promise of starvation, disease, and a lingering misery. In Toronto, the city is ripe for social revolution. One man, helped by the woman he loves, will launch his own fiery crusade to defend the poor, challenge the rich, and fight bigotry. His weapon, a great newspaper. His mission, to help shape the destiny of Canada. His name is Joseph E. Atkinson. Nineteen hundred starts with a mass exodus. One million immigrants crowd onto ships sailing from Europe. They leave behind lives of poverty and squalor. Many immigrants choose Canada and make for Toronto, a boom city of 195,000. The city skyline is crowned by the spires of 238 churches. And almost everyone living here is of British stock. Toronto is poised to make the leap to industrial powerhouse. In Prime Minister Sir Wilfrid Laurier's Canada, this transformation is fueled by protective tariffs, favoring homegrown industry. With the Liberals in power, business is in power because Laurier, whatever he may be seen as, as a national figure and as a uniter of French and English, was in modern terms a very conservative person. He believed in business and free enterprise and had no faith in government. More than 700 factories will set up shop here. This spectacular boom is made possible by a cheap and plentiful supply of workers. Toronto had its respectable side and its British side, and then it had its other side. The poverty was quite shocking. It was just survival of the fittest. And if they didn't have family to depend on, they were out of luck. In many sweatshops, the workers are women or children who often toil for 60 hours a week. This grinding hardship is all too familiar to young newspaper man Joseph E. Atkinson. He was born near the small Ontario village of Newcastle in 1865, the eighth child of a desperately poor British immigrant family. Their only books were the Bible and the Methodist hymn book. His childhood of privation and uh, tragedy shaped him for life. And he would say later that he would never forget his own roots and what, uh, what built him. Uh, his father uh, was killed when he was six months old. His mother took in boarders uh, to try and make ends meet. The boarders and other working men complain bitterly about their hardships. It's young Joseph's introduction to the class struggle and it will shape his life forever. Nobody can escape his beginnings, and I despise the man who is untrue to them. The flood of immigrants is not slowed by the terrible living conditions. In Toronto, the population doubles in one decade, and competition for jobs is fierce. Without a social safety net, unemployment and sickness are the dread of every household. I know a place where a father, mother and two children live in a small house with 17 men. Little girls grow up without self-respect or privacy. 
a chance of those girls. Charity Cook, Toronto Mission. For the homeless, there is always the poor house, named with cruel irony as the house of industry. It echoes from morning till night with the sound of rocks being crushed by feeble men. Starving women and children huddle abandoned in shanty shacks, sometimes in plain view of Toronto City Hall. They could look out their windows and actually see housing that was condemned as unfit for human habitation. In those houses, um, various immigrant groups and the extremely poor try to marry, raise families, and of course, um, escape from grinding poverty. They didn't always succeed, and particularly babies paid a heavy price for this. The infant mortality rate in Toronto is as bad as Bombay. Two in five babies do not live past their first birthday. Poverty kills the baby. The destruction of the poor is their poverty. The rich baby lives, the poor baby dies. Dr. Helen McMurkey, health reformer. Young Joseph Atkinson discovers for himself how fragile life can be. His childhood ends abruptly with the death of his mother, Hannah, leaving the Atkinson children orphans. He believed that, uh, that having to run a boarding house, that her relentless uh, working from dawn till way past dusk, 365 days a year, drove her to an early grave. The delicate teenager with a stammer is thrust into the role of a provider, earning a pittance singing hymns in church and working in a woolen mill. But his life changes dramatically in his next job at a newspaper in Port Hope. I did not have the faintest intention of becoming a newspaper man when I accepted this job. I wanted to be a banker, but six dollars a week was too good to turn down. Thus it was accident, not choice, that set me on my course in life. The publisher teaches young Atkinson how to write and opens up his library of radical writers to the young, inquiring mind. But the story that changes his life forever is Leonard Tilley's rise from drugstore clerk to a father of Confederation. One can scarcely imagine the curious, thrilling, and exciting effect that simple statement had on me. It had never occurred to me that a clerk could ever rise to such heights. The ambitious young Atkinson moves to Toronto and soon becomes the ace reporter at the Globe newspaper. He shares a desk with William Lyon Mackenzie King, who will one day become prime minister. They become friends for life. And it's at the Globe that Atkinson falls in love with a beautiful, talented woman. Her name is Elmina Elliott. At 23, she is already a trailblazing female journalist in a man's world. Almina is smitten by the shy, hymn-singing Atkinson and writes poetry about their romance. The moonlight slants across the beach, the shadows nestle neath the tree, but wind and wave and shore and sky bring back a time not long gone by, the night you sang to me. Elmina and Joseph marry in 1892 and take a modest house in Toronto. Their daughter Ruth is born here. The Atkinsons are sublimely happy, but they also care passionately about many other children leading a tragic existence. <laughs> there is a stark, sordid, ugly poverty here in Toronto. If one could tell with absolute realism of the hovels one has seen, 
speak with blunt truth of the crushed people one has met in casual visits to back streets, <coughs> the words would horrify. In 1899, Joseph Atkinson's crusade for sweeping social reform gets help from a powerful ally, Prime Minister Laurier. As a reporter, Atkinson had written speeches for Laurier, and now the Liberal chieftain supports him for the editor's job at the Toronto Evening Star. A group of Laurier's wealthy friends hire Atkinson and buy the star with one aim in mind, to create a liberal beachhead in a city dominated by the wealthy conservative elite. Methodist hymns echo every day from the windows of the original star building. The 25 printers and boy apprentices who founded the star like to sing as they set type for the paper. Atkinson inherits a newspaper with only 7,000 circulation. But the ambitious newsroom and the new boss share a common goal, to expose wage slavery and the horrors of the slums. There is something wrong with the whole system of things which gives great wealth to a few in good times and leaves hunger and despair to many. The most terrible of all sounds is the unanswered cry of a child for food. In his first bold editorial, Atkinson calls for an end to racial taunting of French Canadians. And he deliberately gives a strong voice to powerless minorities. Atkinson also vehemently opposes the deportations of so-called unemployed foreign immigrants. He argued that uh Many of the Canadians on relief were fine people, and he thought the immigrants were fine people too and should be entitled to the same privileges. It's not long before Almina, Atkinson's wife, and a journalistic whirlwind takes over a full page of the star, using the byline Madge Merton. Her soulful columns strike a resonant chord with the readers. We don't like to see how the poor live, how their babies pine and die, how their mothers grow gaunt and hollow-eyed from care and work, and from lack of food and rest. In a young Canada, women still have no vote, and most are expected to find a husband and bear children. But Almina is cut from a different cloth. She supports both the temperance movement to ban alcohol and the suffragette campaign to win the vote for women. Elmina also highlights the tragedy of children inside institutions, all too often used as cheap labor. There were some glimpses through the gates of pain that chilled the hearts of those who peered in from outside. Some of us know nothing about it, and oh, how little we try to find out. Elmina will be the hidden power behind Joseph Atkinson's meteoric rise in the Canadian newspaper world. He imbues the star with vision. She gives it soul. Working together, they make the paper prosper. What Atkinson was able to do was to use the increasing financial success of his paper to create an independent niche for himself. In other words, instead of him getting the instructions from party politician, he was going to be doing the instructing. Strengthened by his growing independence, Atkinson sends a far-reaching letter to Sir Wilfrid Laurier, now the Liberal opposition leader. It contains a daring blueprint for social reforms in Canada. Dear Sir Wilfrid, with reference to the report on social legislation, old age pensions would naturally be the first. Unemployment point. insurance has been adopted only in Great Britain. A law should also be passed, I think, providing for a minimum wage and maximum hours for women. And Yours very truly, Joseph E. Atkinson. And Laurier, frankly, didn't even answer the letter. 
Uh, there were other liberals who sort of had it thrust at them by this powerful figure from Toronto and, and of course, had to respond because he was a powerful man in Toronto in liberal circles. Undaunted by this lukewarm reaction, the star publisher steps up his crusade for reform and he never wavers from his beliefs. Great wealth is not earned. It is amassed, accumulated, collected, gathered, taken. There are many words to describe the process, but earned is not one of them. The newspaper chief has raised his battle standard on behalf of the working class and the poor. But a raging inferno soon plunges him into a much wider conflict. It only takes a few hours. The Great Fire of 1904 reduces the heart of Toronto to a smoldering rubble. The entire staff of the Daily Star is called out by editor Joseph Atkinson to cover the massive fire. It was a battle of giants, and only men built of the stuff that heroes are made of had any right to stand in the path of the mighty conflagration. Overnight, 5,000 people lose their jobs. Investigators find the absence of water hydrants left firefighters almost helpless against the blaze. The public scandal propels Atkinson beyond the pages of his newspaper into changing the life of the city. Atkinson accelerates the star's newfound civic activism by dispatching his reporters into the reeking slums where even health inspectors seldom enter. Sewage from thousands of crude toilets is mixed with blood and gore from every slaughterhouse in the city. This deadly stew of toxic waste all flows into Lake Ontario, the main source of drinking water for Toronto. Toronto is still essentially uncivilized. It is not supplied with water fit to drink. And for the sheer lack of public thought, the city lets its own babies die in quite unnecessary holocaust. Dr. Helen McMurkey, health reformer. By 1910, the star's campaigning pays off. Toronto's water is at last made safe to drink, thanks to a new filtration and chlorination plant. It reinforces Atkinson's belief that all vital services should be under public control. The 19th century gave away nearly everything on this continent that was worth having. And the 20th century will be kept busy wrestling with millionaires and billionaires to get them back. When the privately owned Toronto Street Railway lurches towards bankruptcy, Atkinson steps up his attack on the railway's high fares and poor service. Public opinion slowly turns in favor of a takeover by the city of Toronto. The railway is reborn as the Toronto Transit Commission and becomes a model for public transportation. But the reforms dearest to Atkinson are all about humanity. He once considered becoming a church minister. Now he and Almina are strong supporters of the Methodist Church's social gospel movement. It was a social movement developed by the more liberal progressive members of the Protestant denominations, intended to try and meet the ills of society, and it covered everything from temperance, because at that time alcoholism was rampant and a huge problem, through to widows' pensions, uh, workers' compensation, and all kinds of social programs or supports. In the early 1900s, Joseph Atkinson knows there are only two main powers of persuasion for social reform, the pulpit and the press. He enlists more than a dozen churchmen to write for the Star. Ministers like the influential Reverend Peter Bryce and the firebrand Reverend Salem Bland. The workers of the world are in revolt. They believe the present social order is not just. It is good for the strong, 
but damnable for the weak. The tide of destitution is rising steadily and threatens to overwhelm us. Atkinson, it would seem to me, had um, a much larger pulpit than probably any minister uh, in Toronto because he was able to use his paper to do the kind of reporting to expose the problem and then to begin to develop the solutions to it. Atkinson starts rebuilding the renamed Toronto Daily Star as the paper of the people, and his instructions are clear. Get the news first. Sew it up so the opposition cannot get it. Leave no crumbs uncollected. Then play it big. The publisher pulls out all the stops to build readership. He wanted readers, and, it, and he was accused of doing anything to get readers for his newspaper. And it might be true, he didn't leave much out. Uh, Razzle-dazzle journalism, all kinds of grand and glorious coverage to crime and other uh, popular topics. All kinds of bizarre and, and weird and wonderful contests to, uh, to get readers to buy the star. One wildly popular star contest urges Toronto's children to catch the largest number of flies. Every summer, Toronto is infested with clouds of flies from the city's livestock. Atkinson and Dr. Charles Hastings, the medical officer of health, devise a crusade, masquerading as a contest. The fly has got no friends and doesn't deserve any. He carries disease to the baby and fills the city cemetery. Swat the fly, and you may save a baby's life. There was a $25 first prize, which at that point in time, this is the beginning of a recession, huge amount of money, um, particularly for children from the slum areas, which would be parts of the city that would generate the largest number of flies. Toronto's children catch 3.3 million flies. And one of the big winners is 14-year-old Beatrice White. She manages to kill an amazing half a million insects. This is the first of many collaborations between the star publisher and health officer Dr. Hastings. None would be more successful than the fight to clean up Toronto's bad milk. Hastings has a very personal commitment to the milk campaign because one of his daughters died from drinking bad milk. It had a lot of germs in it that caused disease like typhoid and diphtheria and scarlet fever. When they analyzed it, it was shocking how filthy it was. If you fed this to a small infant, they would sicken and die, and it was just viewed as one of those things that happened to many babies. But it does, needless to say, start ringing significant alarm bells for parents and the medical profession and um, Joseph Atkinson. Pasteurization of the city's milk finally becomes compulsory in 1914, but it will be many more years before people accept milk as a health food. Every day the star hits the streets, it's a small victory for Joseph Atkinson. He has to fend off blatant product promotions by his financial backers, while keeping the real stories about the downtrodden on the front page. He was always conscious that the people who buy the paper every day were the people who mattered in his life, not the people who loaned him money and uh, wanted a voice in the board of directors because he considered their advice to be foolish, wrong, and immoral. Atkinson knows that advertising is the star's lifeblood. Every night, he and Almina perform the same ritual, holding their breath as they tally up the ads in that day's paper. But the need for ads doesn't stop Atkinson from launching a costly campaign. It exposes price-fixing cartels that gouge the public. The first to be brought to justice are 150 plumbers. Over the next five years, the star smashes many of the other 80 price-fixing rings that exploit families. Atkinson recruits a brilliant editor in Harry Hindmarsh, 
to drive his reporters. Hindmarsh will eventually become Atkinson's son-in-law, and it's his job to spell out what's news and what isn't. My first impressions were it was just exactly as I'd seen in the movies. Very exciting, noisy and exciting, shouting, reporters pounding their stories out and yelling, boy! Everybody sort of came to attention. That was the first time I saw Mr. Atkinson. He came in through the editorial department, very, very neatly dressed, always had uh, a crease in his trousers, just as sharp as a razor. I found out he was the big boss. He was the, uh, the president of the paper and the publisher and whatnot. Oh yes, I was frightened. Atkinson also strikes a note of fear into the hearts of the privileged rich with his incessant calls for a wealth tax. He clashes with his biggest advertiser, Sir John Eaton, head of the department store chain. Privately, Eaton views Atkinson's radical policies as Bolshevism and in 1921 pulls all his advertising from the star. The boycott is supposed to bring Atkinson to his knees, but it also hurts sales at Eaton's. The year-long, costly standoff only ends when Sir John dies suddenly at 46. The Eaton ads quickly return to the star. But behind his titanic newspaper struggles, Atkinson also displays the human touch. He launches two campaigns that will change the lives of Toronto's needy children. In the early 20th century, Toronto is a cruel, heartless place. Men and women often abandon their children to the gutter and a life of drunkenness and crime. Joseph Atkinson's star devotes front page coverage to their misery. Every reporter is assigned to write about the slums. Even a young Ernest Hemingway, who kept this star story in his private papers all his life. Her husband had left her with three more small children to provide for. She had worked until she had become a shadow, but she would never give up. She worked for them, she starved for them, she literally gave them her body. When a woman begins to sacrifice, there is no limit except death. Children were living on the street. The loss of a job, a low paying job for, for a single mother of three, uh, basically meant uh, you're, you're on the street. Uh, sweatshop opportunities for, uh, for children that we now rail against in terms of, of other uh, third world countries. But uh, Atkinson saw progress of the nation, progress of Toronto through the prism of what we did with children. In 1901, Joseph and Elmina Atkinson decide to give slum children a day's respite from the hot, fetid city streets. They take over the Fresh Air Fund, first established by their friend John J. Kelso, founder of the Children's Aid Society. Each year, the fund hires pleasure boats to whisk the children around the Toronto Islands. Later, the program is expanded to give children two weeks holiday in summer camps. Elmina is deeply moved by the early Fresh Air Fun trips, all paid for by readers. The Eurydice was crowded with a mob of bad little boys and good little boys, and girls who would have been pretty had they been clean. Besides these were the mothers, tired, dispirited, often with an air of former gentility, and too often carrying on their faces the marks of their unfortunate lives. For some children, winter brings festive cheer. For others, 
little more than cold comfort. So in 1906, the Atkinsons launched the Star's Santa Claus Fund, distributing Christmas gifts to every child under 12 from destitute families. Once the two funds were well established and run six months a year, Elmina Atkinson gradually withdraws from the Star Newsroom. Now there will be more time for her own family, daughter Ruth and son Joseph Story. And Elmina has firm views on raising children. What is right for a woman is right for a man. A girl should read the same books her brother should read. In most of the books for girls, there are too many dolls and too much tears. A frequent guest at the Atkinson house over the years is Mackenzie King. He even has his own private guest room, but still grumbles about the lack of a strop for his razor. Atkinson has the ear of his old friend on many important social issues. I remember several occasions when the man was introduced to me as the Prime Minister, which I guess five didn't mean too much to me. But Mackenzie King was sitting in the other big chair in the front den, and I was told I had to be very quiet, but I could be in the room while they talked and my granddad would let me lace and unlace his boots and as long as I was very good and quiet. The Roaring Twenties is a decade of freewheeling optimism right across Canada. The boom years will soon vault the star into the lead as the biggest newspaper in the country. More readers and more ads also give Joseph Atkinson a bigger voice. People got their news in those days from the newspapers. There was eight or ten editions a day, so when the news happened, you got it that very day in the paper. The 20s also give birth to a new technology, radio. Atkinson and his son Joseph Story launched the number one radio station, CFCA, mixing popular music, news, church sermons, and hockey broadcasts. The kid line is on the ice. Busher Jackson, Charlie Conacher, and Joe Primo. Maybe they can break the deadlock. In this era of rapid expansion, Atkinson uses his own money to build an impressive new home for the star on King Street in Toronto. But in 1929, Euphoria turns to despair in a heartbeat. Working people watch helplessly as the Wall Street stock market crash demolishes every debt-ridden company. Millions of lives are ruined. They lost their jobs, they lost their houses. Any dreams they had for the future or for their children went right out the window. They were just scrabbling to make ends meet and get the next meal on the table. But even as the Great Depression inflicts deep wounds on the entire continent, Joseph Atkinson faces up to the greatest tragedy of his life. In 1931, after a long illness, Elmina Atkinson dies at the age of 64. Elmina has always been Joseph's soulmate and the conscience of his newspaper. Her death leaves a huge void in his life, and the great publisher slips into seclusion. The two greatest influences on my life are the Christian religion, of course, and my wife. His newspaper staff fears that Joseph Atkinson may have lost not only his wife, but also his fire. But Atkinson's warrior spirit will soon be rekindled by the most important challenge of his career. In just five years, the 30s depression brings Canada to its knees. Industry-rich Toronto is thought to be immune from this fallout. 
But by 1934, 120,000 people in Toronto are unemployed and on relief. What the Depression did, you know, wasn't create uh, worse conditions for the Canadian poor. Where the Depression made a difference was more often to middle-class people who'd been accustomed to floating above all that poverty and social turmoil and misery as something that wasn't any of their business. Suddenly, they found themselves knocked off their, their raft and deep in the soup. The harrowing images of the unemployed have a profound effect on Joseph Atkinson, a lifelong Methodist now in open conflict with big business. Business has no right to use workmen when times are good and work is plentiful, and cast them aside when work is scarce and times are bad. Even the slaveholders did better than that. Let us attack the problem. Since its very first days at the Star, Atkinson always promoted the best ideas for a welfare state from around the world. And he lived his own life by a single golden rule. Treat others as you would wish to be treated yourself. Everyone knows, and some have their knowledge out of bitter experience, that thrift is no guarantee against a penniless old age. That willingness to work is no guarantee against unemployment. As the Depression begins to bottom out, a disgruntled workforce trudges back into the factories for less pay and longer hours. It's fertile territory for trade unions and their new political allies as they press for a new social order. A tough-fisted Army Brigadier General named Dennis Draper is hired as police chief to clamp down hard on Communist Party rallies. Draper organized his mounted squad, which were known as Draper's Dragoons, to raid the park. And many innocent people were slugged on the head. Everyone was afraid of communism. So the police felt justified in putting down any signs of it. And these policemen would just, you know, beat the hell out of you. And I remember they came to the star office on that Sunday afternoon with blood coming running down from their head injuries and the star made a big thing out of that and rightly so. Rival newspapers accuse the star of being soft on communists but Atkinson comes out strongly in favor of the people's right to free speech and condemns police brutality. It is up to the courts not the police to decide if what is said at a meeting is unlawful. Atkinson's unswerving support for the labor movement is really put to the test in the GM Oshawa strike in April 1937. An American trade union tries to organize 3,700 Canadian auto workers, and they stage a walkout. But both GM and Ontario Premier Mitchell Hepburn want a pliant labor force, impotent, cheap, and unorganized by the union recruiters. We know what these agitators are up to. Well, this has got to stop, and we are going to stop it. If necessary, we'll raise an army to do it. Mitchell Hepburn, Premier of Ontario. Hepburn mobilizes an intimidating 500-man force to crush what he sees as a communist uprising. They are ridiculed by the strikers as Hepburn's hussars and sons of Mitch's. Atkinson assigns his top reporters to cover the strike, runs full coverage in the Star, and talks by phone to union leaders almost every day. He put the Star firmly on the side of, of, of the workers. No, not against General Motors, which had actually been looking for a settlement, but against the Hepburn government. Atkinson utterly despised a man who probably is in close competition for the worst uh, premier Ontario has ever had in a whole variety of spheres from performance to, to private character. After a two-week deadlock, it is Atkinson himself who helps to broker the deal accepted by both GM and the unions, 
that ends the strike. But oddly enough, Atkinson does not extend his public support of the labor movement to the workers on his own newspaper. The editorial employees at the Star decided to organize a union, uh, but Mr. Atkinson refused to negotiate with them. At that time, the newspapers bargained jointly. Mr. Atkinson thought that newspaper guilds should organize the other employees, and then we should engage in joint bargaining. But it's hard to understand that position in view of what he said in other instances. The runaway success of the Toronto Star has made Joseph Atkinson immensely wealthy. But he never likes rich men. And he continues to call for a high tax on excessive profits to help pay for welfare programs. The state is not wet nursing unfortunate people. It is spreading the income of the nation more evenly so that there may be less anxiety, less destitution, less misery, and less suffering. Atkinson is ostracized by the rich and powerful who mock his newspaper as the Red Star. He would dine alone at one of the clubs in Toronto because none of the industrialists and the, and the, uh, the capitalist elite would have anything to do with him. The elite would vilify him through other newspapers. He must have been one of the toughest guys that we've seen in this country for the abuse he took, for the stands he took. After half a century at the helm of the Toronto Star, old age is finally catching up with Joseph Atkinson. He still feels the loss of his wife, Elmina, 17 years after her death. He was warm. Um, I adored him. He was uh, a wonderful, wonderful man. And um, would suffer my little childhood songs and little stories. And, and he always had time for me. He was a great believer in children and, and their potential. The man scorned by the telegram as Holy Joe for his fondness of quoting the Bible has at last grown battle weary. I have spent my life fitting out a great ship for a voyage. And every time I am ready to set sail, I have to make some further improvements for a still greater voyage. Atkinson has weathered many great storms and is immensely proud of his memorable victories. Most of the social reforms listed in his famous letter to Laurier and virtually ignored by the Liberal chief, had now become the law of the land. Universal health care will be the last strand in the social safety net. Appropriately, it is Atkinson's oldest friend who sends the last letter the newspaper baron will receive. Throughout the whole of that period, I have had in you the truest of friends, both political and personal. William Lyon Mackenzie King. The next day, May 8, 1948, Joseph Atkinson dies quietly at his home. In his will, the great publisher left the bulk of his fortune, including his newspaper, to a charitable trust in his name. To this very day, the Atkinson Charitable Foundation and the Toronto Star, as well as his heirs and executives, are bound by his guiding principle, humanity above all. A humble man, Joseph Atkinson believed the big story was not about him, simply his grand ideals. It was quite a story. Toronto probably would not be Toronto without Joseph Atkinson and the Star, largely because there has to be a voice of social conscience. The Star had a very different origin, and when Atkinson took over and used it as a vehicle for his own 
um, social gospel beliefs, he was consistent. And that's highly significant because people rely on voices like that. I think the reason why Joseph Atkinson is my hero and the hero for many of us is because he built a newspaper from a rag that was about to fold into the most successful, profitable, and biggest newspaper in the country. At the same time, through his business, he promoted his social conscience. Imagine if everybody in society, if every one of us, uh, took a good look at our difficulties and our trials and tribulations as children and growing up, and then went about trying to help other people with the same problems. If everybody was as generous and learned so much from their experiences as, as Joseph Atkinson did, it would be a much different society. <laughs>